My grandfather, my mother's father, was a man named Noah Sloan. We called him Pop. Pop lived most of his life in the hills of eastern Kentucky, and he worked hard his whole life. Uh, his, he and my grandmother ran a series of small businesses until, Pop, uh, until she passed away in the late 1960s, and eventually Pop sold his general store and spent his last years living on and off with various uh, members of his family. For a while, when I was in college, Pop lived with our family. He was about 80 years old at the time and had begun to experience uh, some dementia or some beginning Alzheimer's, so Pop was a bit confused when he lived with us. He was under the impression that he had come to our house to work for my dad, and he saw all of us as employees working for my father at our home. Work was just how Pop made sense of his life. Well, one day my brother Joe and I were out in the garage, and we were both college students at the time. We were lifting weights. We had a small weight bench in our garage. We're just lifting weights at our house in Florida. Well, Pop came out one day, and he stood in the doorway that divided our garage from our house. And he stood there just watching us for a while. And he stood like this. And we're lifting weights, and he's just watching. After a few minutes, he finally said, what you boys doing? And my brother said, we're working out, Pop. And he went, working? <laughs> I do more work in a day than you boys do in a month. And he turned around and walked back inside. And we still laugh about that story today because it was pretty much true. Even at age 80, Pop could outwork the both of us. I've always kind of appreciated how Pop looked at work, how it was important to him in his life. And today we're going to see that work is also important to God. We're in a series now called Growing Smaller, The Paradox of Spiritual Greatness. And our theme for the entire series is found in Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 25. And let me read this text for you. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is what Jeff and I are calling the growing smaller principle. And that is that greatness is found in serving. And we looked at how this principle of growing smaller, of serving, looks like in marriage. We looked at what it looks like in families. We've looked at what it looks like in your neighborhood, in your community. And today we're going to look at what it means to serve, what it means to grow smaller where you work. I'm going to look today at a text from Colossians chapter 3 beginning at verse 28. It's a text that actually allows Paul to go back over and review some things we've already talked about in this series. He writes, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Let's pause there for a moment. Here Paul is teaching that the gospel transforms the marriage relationship from one of virtual ownership where the wife or the woman has no rights whatsoever, is not really even seen as a person, to rather a relationship of mutual respect and sacrifice. Now this was a revolutionary idea in Paul's day and is still a revolutionary idea in many parts of our world today. Then he goes on, "'Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged.'" Again, let's pause. These two sentences sound pretty basic to us, but Paul is revolutionizing his reader's understanding of family relationships. No longer are children to obey their parents out of fear, out of fear of punishment, but rather out of respect and love for Christ. No longer are parents, especially fathers, to rely on the power of their position. Remember the law of patria potestas, where in that culture fathers had absolute authority over their families. Rather, they are to love their children as Christ has loved them. And now Paul turns his attention to what I would call relationships in the workplace. He writes, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. 
Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Now, before we get to this specific text, we need to back up just a bit. Because before we look at our work, we need to understand, first of all, that God works. God works. Now, the notion of a working God is peculiarly a Christian notion. That is, it's very unique among the great faiths and belief systems of the world. In most world religions or mythological systems, the god or gods, small g, simply don't concern themselves with work at all. The idea of work is more uh, of a punishment for human beings. It's uh, beneath gods to work. But in a biblical worldview, God is a God who works. And His work, the Bible tells us, is creating. The whole Bible begins with a God who works, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work He had been doing. So on the seventh day, He rested from all His work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it He rested from all the work of creating that He had done. The Bible tells us God worked and that His work was creating. Now, how did God create? The Bible says He created from nothing. There were three different Hebrew words for create, and the one used here is bara, which means to cre create something new, to create something from nothing. And this word is only used for God and His creation. The Old Testament also had two Hebrew words for labor or for work. One referred to work that is raw and unskilled. Kind of like me trying to build a bookcase. I could probably cobble together a bookcase, but it would be very raw and barely functional. The other word designates skilled labor, work performed by a master craftsman, by an artisan who creates something that's not only functional, but extraordinary in beauty and craftsmanship. And that's the word the Bible uses to describe God's work. Because God's work was good. Throughout the creation account, we see, and it was good. Finally, the Hebrew word translated completed refers to a task that has been finished or accomplished perfectly. The Bible teaches that God worked, His work was creation, His work was good, and His work was finished. Bonus question, where else in all of Scripture do we see the phrase, it is finished? Right. Jesus cried those words from the cross as he finished the work of our salvation. By faith, we are recreated, born again through his work of our redemption. So, why did God work? Why did God create? The Bible teaches us that God created the universe out of love, that God created the universe for his glory and his pleasure. The psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. God created the universe for us so that we would know him, so that we would know his glory and his love. In summary, God's work was good, perfect, and complete. Now, why is it so important that we begin by understanding God's work? Well, because secondly, God created us to work. God works, God created us to work. I wonder if you can remember your first job. The first job for which you were paid in dollars. Mine was mowing the lawn. Maybe that's the same for you. When I was eight years old, I had a little 20-inch hand-me-down red bicycle that I was supposed to put in the garage every day after riding around the neighborhood playing with my friends. Well, one day in particular, I was in a hurry, got home for supper, left the bike out in the front yard. The next morning, I woke up to take it to school, and it was gone. Someone had stolen my little red bike. My first thought was, what kind of person steals a little boy's bike? It was the first time I remember feeling like the world was an unsafe place. But my second thought was, uh-oh, I'm in big trouble. Because I knew it was my responsibility to put my bike away, and I had failed to do that, and now my bike was gone. Well, my dad sat me down and told me I could get a new bike, but I would have to earn the money myself. And so he offered me a job, and that job was mowing our lawn. He would pay me $1 each time I mowed the lawn. Now our lawn was pretty small, 
but we didn't have a power mower. We had one of those old rotary push mowers with the blades that, that turned around like this. I can still hear the sound of it in my mind. You know the kind I'm talking about. My dad thought that at eight years of age, I was big enough to push that mower around our lawn and to earn that money back. And I thought so too. So I looked up in the Sears catalog the bike I wanted to replace my lost bike, and it was a 26-incher with a, with a generator that was attached to the tire that would create the electric light. I thought it was awesome. I'd have the coolest bike in the whole neighborhood. But it cost the astronomical sum of $56. So I mowed, and I mowed, and I mowed. My mom says the first day I came in with blisters hanging off my hands. I don't know if it was that bad or not, but I wanted that bike. Now that job didn't feel much like a gift to me, but it was. Look at Genesis chapter 1 as the Bible describes God's work. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The Bible teaches that human beings and only human beings are created in the image of God. Now that phrase means, among other things, that human beings are created with unique capacities among all the creatures of the earth. And that we are created for a unique kind of relationship with God. For example, human beings are created with unique intelligence. For 10 years, we had a, a great family dog, a, a chocolate lab, Labrador Retriever. And labs are really smart. Our dog was smart. She figured out how to, she could sleep on the couch all night, even when she wasn't supposed to. And she would get off that couch just in time before I came down and caught her. I knew she'd been on the couch. I could feel it. It was warm, but she was in her crate. She was smart. But our dog never wrote a book, never read a book didn't possess that kind of intelligence. Human beings have a unique capacity to worship. We have a unique capacity to love. We have a unique capacity to create. We're created with a unique capacity for free will and with a unique capacity to work, the Bible says. Now notice that work was part of God's creation, part of God's design right from the beginning. Some think that work was the result of the fall into sin. That's not true. Our work became more difficult, more painful through sin. It was cursed by sin, but work was part of God's original design. And I have news for you. I hope this doesn't disappoint you. But in the new heaven and new earth, in heaven itself, there will be work for us to do. We will serve with Him because our work will be redeemed to what it's supposed to be. All that to say that when we work, whether that work is commuting to an office in the city every day, whether it's sitting in front of a computer all day, whether it's doing four loads of laundry and changing diapers all day. Whatever we do for work, we are expressing the very image of God and fulfilling part of His purpose for our creation. All work is a gift from God. Work is a gift because work gives us a way to support ourselves and to be generous with others. The New Testament says that a man who will not work is worse than an unbeliever. Those who work are also told to be willing to be generous and to share with those who cannot work. Work is a gift because it gives us a purpose and a meaning. Did you know the Bible makes no distinction at all between sacred and secular work? Between what I do or what Jeff does or what Bruce does as pastors and what you do as a, an engineer, as a teacher or a salesman? No distinction whatsoever. There's no distinction between the work we do for a paycheck and work we do as volunteers without pay. The Bible does not give an indication of retirement the way we think of it. We'll talk more about that in the weeks ahead when we talk about serving or growing smaller in the church and in the world. We all have a God-given work to do. And work is a gift because it allows us to serve God and to serve others. Now here's where we get to the growing smaller principle at work. Thirdly, our work serves God and serves others. The summer after I graduated from high school, uh, my family moved from New York to Florida. And if you've ever moved your family across country, you know that's a pretty big deal. 
This was the first time my parents had been able to hire a moving company. The church my dad was going to uh, provided the moving company. So they just trusted the moving company to move all their furniture, all their stuff from New York to Florida, and they just drove a car down. My mother still likes to tell the story of arriving at her new home in Florida, 1,200 miles away from where she lived in New York, going into the home and going to the refrigerator that had been moved from New York to Florida, opening the refrigerator and finding in the egg tray a single egg wrapped up in packing paper. Evidently, uh, the moving company or the guy who was working at that time uh, noticed that my mom had left an egg in the refrigerator in New York and he dutifully wrapped that egg up carefully and they moved that single egg all the way from New York to Florida without breaking it. She told, still tells that story. I've often thought that that would make a great commercial for a moving company today because that's a good moving company. The guy who took the time to pack up that single egg was a great example, I think, of what Paul is teaching us about when he writes in Ephesians chapter 6. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Now, three things here we need to see. First, the gospel tells us our work matters to God. Our work matters to God. A few months ago, I had to take a quick plane flight from, uh, from Chicago to Nashville to visit a church down there. And on the return flight to Chicago, we hit some bad weather. As the plane approached, approached the runway, you could feel it just wobbling and shaking in the wind. You could feel the gust. And we hit the runway hard, hard enough to bounce. You could feel the plane bounce down the runway. Finally, we coasted to a stop. Now, I've shared here before that I don't have a fear of flying. I do have a fear of landing, however. And so I often try to thank pilots after a landing, especially a rough landing. So this time I figured it was probably a tough landing to execute, so I wanted to thank the pilot, whoever it was. But I got to the front of the airplane, the cockpit door was shut, so I really couldn't say thank you. But I would have, because I wanted to express my thanks for a job well done, because in a sense, that pilot had expressed love for me and for all the other passengers by doing his or her job well. And if you understand your job properly, your work properly, whatever that is, it's a way of loving your neighbor. And for that reason, your work matters to God. Pastor Tim Keller writes, all jobs, not only the so-called helping professions, are fundamentally ways of loving your neighbor. Christians do not have to do direct ministry or nonprofit charitable work in order to love others through their jobs. The Apostle Paul says it this way, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether slave or free. Sometimes I think uh, we think that in order to be witnesses for Christ at the workplace, we need to carry our Bibles around and make sure people know we believe the Bible, or we need to be constantly trying to engage them in spiritual conversations. And those are not bad things to do, by the way, and we certainly can do those things. But the Scripture is telling us that one of the other things we can do is simply do our jobs well. Think about it this way. What does it say about Jesus if we do our jobs poorly? If we do just enough to get by? If we're shoddy in our work? What does it say about our Lord if we are diligent and trustworthy, if we consistently go above and beyond the call to serve our boss and to serve our coworkers with excellence? Which is a better witness for the God we claim to serve? I like to think that the guy who moved the egg from New York to Florida all those years ago was a follower of Jesus. I don't know if he was or not. But I like to think he was because that's how I think Jesus would have done that job. And that makes me ask myself, would I have taken the time to pack up that single leg and move it all the way to Florida or would I have just tossed it in the garbage when no one was looking? I mean, who's going to miss one egg? 
If I'm honest, I have to admit that I probably would have tossed the egg aside as not being worth the effort. And I think Jesus is teaching me and us that the egg is worth the effort because he is worth the effort. How we do our work matters because all work well done honors God. Our work matters because all work well done blesses others. Our work is a way of loving our neighbor. Second, we see the gospel revolutionizes the employer-employee relationship. Let me explain. Paul writes, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Now the word for slave here, as we went over a couple of weeks ago, is doulos. It carries a bit different meaning than it does in our culture today. We think of slave, we think of the Civil War type slaves. That's not what's being talked about here. Doulos refers to sort of the working class of people across the Roman Empire. We know that in the Roman Empire, roughly one-third of the population would have been considered doulos or bond servants. These would have been the ancient equivalent of sort of hourly laborers, blue-collar workers, or migrant workers. They most likely did not own much property. They depended on the more affluent classes to provide jobs and livelihoods. Uh, in any case, they were people for whom this message would have been truly revolutionary, and here's why. Paul is giving them the revolutionary good news that ultimately they do not work for their earthly masters, but rather for Christ himself. Now this is revolutionary because when you know who you work for, when you know why you are working, everything changes. For example, when you work for a boss that you fear or resent, your motivation is to simply do what's necessary and avoid punishment. You'll tend to work harder when you know the boss is around and paying attention. You'll tend to work less hard when you don't think the boss is around or paying attention. Or when you work just for your paycheck that comes at the end of the week, you become a slave or you tend to become a slave to your job and a slave to money. However, if you know that you work for Christ, if your boss is the one who created you, who loves you, who died for you, who dwells in you by his Holy Spirit and promises you an eternal reward, your motivation changes. Your motivation now is to honor and serve him with your very best. When you vote work for his glory rather than for an earthly paycheck, you're no longer a slave to your job. You're no longer a slave to your boss. You're no longer a slave to your money. You're free to work, to serve with passion and joy, whatever the job. An executive here at FECG recently told me that uh, he was uh, some time ago trying to encourage a coworker who was struggling with uh, their job in this company. And he tried to explain his perspective as a Christian that he worked not for the company, not for the boss, but he worked for Jesus. He worked for Christ. He worked for God. Well, evidently that employee, that fellow employee, went out and told some other people and it got back to the CEO of the company that this executive was saying that he didn't work for the company, he worked for God. And it kind of disturbed the CEO, so he called him in. And he said, listen, I've heard some things that you've been saying that you work for God. You care to explain what that means? And the guy said to him, to his boss, what, you think I do all this stuff for you? You think I work this hard for the company? No, and then he explained what he means by working for God. His boss was a little confused, but he was impressed. The gospel transforms the, the employer-employee relationship. And finally, the gospel tells us that people matter. Notice now that Paul speaks to masters, those who have authority and position. He says, masters, treat your slaves the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he was both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Here Paul's turning his attention to those who are masters. In our world this would be talking to CEOs, to employers, managers, or bosses. And it's interesting that Paul does not question the master's authority or position, doesn't question that the master needs to run an effective business or company, doesn't question the economics of the boss-employee relationship. He rather talks about treatment how masters treat their slaves. He's warning them about managing by threat. He's warning them about leading through fear and intimidation. He's warning them about bullying people just because they can. 
You need to see this is also revolutionary. And the revolutionary part is that masters need to be concerned at all with the treatment of their bond slaves or bond servants. For in that world at that time, a master would have considered his servants to be his property. And when he would have felt completely within his rights as an owner to treat his servants any way he pleased. But Paul is pointing out that the gospel changes everything. It changes the marriage relationship. It changes family relationships. It even changes the employer-employee, the master-slave relationship. Not only does our work matter to Christ, but people matter to Him as well. Therefore, how we treat people matters because Jesus loves and values the bondservant as much as He does the master, the hourly employee as much as the CEO. So here's the growing smaller principle at work. Employees serve when they work as if they are working for Christ Himself. Bosses serve when they love their employees as Christ loves them. In his book, Gates of Fire, an author named Stephen Pressfield tells the story of King Leonidas of the Spartans and his 300 warriors who fought the Persians at the famous Battle of Thermopylae back several millennia ago. Toward the end of the book, after King Leonidas dies with his troops, one of his servants describes his king with these words. Now listen to these words. This is out of a secular novel based on an historical event. He writes, I will tell you what a king is. A king does not abide within his tent while his men bleed and die upon the field. A king does not dine while his men go hungry, nor sleep when they stand at watch upon the wall. A king does not command his men's loyalty through fear, nor purchase it with gold. He earns their love by the sweat of his own back and the pains he endures for their sake. That which comprises the harshest burden, a king lifts first and sets down last. A king does not require service of those he leads, but provides it to them. He serves them, not they him. Jesus said it this way. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we are to serve at home, in our community, and in our work. Because our King first served us. Will you bow with me in prayer? Lord God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for your work, your work of creation, your work of redemption in each one of our lives and hearts. We thank you for giving us a work to do, whatever that work is. We thank you for the work that supports our families. We thank you for the work you give that supports your kingdom. Teach us to serve others in the way that we work. And may we serve others in the way that we treat and love them. And may we offer our own work as we serve you, our Lord and our King. Amen. Would you please stand for the benediction? May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may we serve him as he has served us. Amen. Have a great day.